good. Hope you had a Merry Christmas and a wonderful Christmas. We celebrated the Lord's birth and the greatest gift that has been given to us in eternal life and the forgiveness of our sins. And uh, if you didn't get what you wanted or you asked to receive, and you have Jesus Christ in your life this morning, then you have everything you need. Amen? It's just going to break. It's just going to run out of batteries or power or a circuit's going to break if it's electronics or whatever it is. You know, we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ this morning. And so we could rejoice because of that. If you have a Bible this morning, I want to share with you from the Old Testament this morning in the book of Isaiah chapter 9 and the 6th and 7th verse is what we'll read this morning. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'll read it briefly and, uh, and I'm going to try to condense and be brief this morning since we have the children uh, here this morning. And so uh, right before I got up here, my wife looked at me and said, you're going to be short, right? And I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to have to do some, you know, put this message in the dryer for a little bit so it could shrink. And so uh, that's what I'm planning on doing. But, you know, there's a there's a, it's such a great passage in the Bible. And uh, Isaiah nine, verse six is where I want to be reading from. I've entitled the message simply a child is born. Notice The book of Isaiah, chapter 9, in the 6th verse. What it says there. The Lord is speaking to Isaiah and He gives gives him this wonderful prophecy regarding the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Notice what it says. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Let's pray briefly. Father, we thank you once again for your word. Speak to us now as we are listening to your voice. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What's in a name? I heard the story this past week of a young man who got stuck with the last name of Odd. That was his last name, Odd. And you can imagine being the ridicule of everybody who knew his name. That's kind of odd. You're odd. And that was his name, and so uh, he just hated it. After living his entire life with this miserable name, he made it known to his family that when he died, he didn't want his name on his tombstone. He didn't want people walking by his tombstone and saying, That's odd right there. That's odd. Well, if you could imagine a blank grave marker, people walking by and reading the different names on the grave markers, and then they see a blank one, what would they say? That's odd. (laughs) What's in a name? Well, I guess it depends what your name is, right? If you have to go through life with an odd name, it would be embarrassing, it would be difficult. In the Old Testament, we do have some interesting names. One such as Mephibosheth. How would you like to have that name, Mephibosheth, in the Old Testament? Or in the New Testament, there's a young lady in the book of Acts, chapter 9, which we'll see in a couple weeks, a young lady whose name is Dorcas. Who would have named their daughter Dorcas? Not today, right? 
Maybe back then when they didn't know or didn't have uh, that in their vocabulary, dork, dorkus, right? I don't think they said to her, you're such a dorkus. No, they didn't say that. You know, it's interesting, many of you don't know, maybe some of my family members here know that I kind of grew up as a young person with an interesting nickname. You know, my older brother, Robert, when we were, when I was just a toddler, uh, I'm told that he couldn't pronounce my name David, which is my given name, and so he called me Bida. That was my nickname. Don't call me that, by the way. I won't answer it. But anyways, uh, he called me Bida, and somehow the name stuck amongst my family. And, you know, those aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and of course friends that got wind of it would make fun of me they would call me Beta bailey or Beta and the jets somebody would sing you know Beta Beta and the jets you better stop that or i'm gonna beat you up i would hear that one interesting what's in a name my wife and I, when we were choosing the names of our children, we chose biblical names, at least for the first two. Joshua, the successor of Moses. My son up here playing the guitar, Joshua. Stephen, I named him uh, after the first martyr and that faithful waiter in Acts chapter 7 that we just learned of in the book of Acts. When we came to our daughter, she was a difficult one to name. Uh, my wife and I went down the list of every girl that we ever knew. And finally, we came to Clarissa. And so what's in a name? Every name has a meaning. It's interesting that when the angel Gabriel came to the Virgin Mary and told her that she was going to have a child, a baby boy, in Luke chapter 1, verse 30, the Bible tells us that the angel Gabriel said, and you shall call his name Jesus. His name is Jesus. The name Jesus, of course, we know means God is salvation. And his name, Philippians chapter 2 tells us, his name has been his exalted to the highest name. The name above all names. There's power in the name of Jesus. Have you discovered that? That there's power in the name of Jesus? You know, we could be in a coffee shop, crowded coffee house, everybody's talking, and somebody mentions the name of Jesus, and what happens? There's like a hush, right? Every conversation stops, people look, well, who's saying the name of Jesus? That happens. I, I meet with several of you many times in coffee houses or you know, restaurants, and we mention the name of Jesus loud or praise Jesus, and everybody's like, whoa, what's going on? You know? You say Oprah or Buddha, Hare Krishna, Joseph Smith, you know, need a, no response. But you say the name of Jesus, and you're sure to get a response. It's interesting. Here in the Bible, we have five names given to Jesus. This child that would be born, God's Son that would be given. Five names are given to Him. Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. You know what? If you didn't get what you wanted under the tree, consider these five names as gifts that God has given to you this morning. We're going to look at them briefly this morning. Five things, five names that were given to God. I think it's important to understand concerning Jesus that before he was born as a baby in Bethlehem, he pre-existed in heaven. He was the eternal and is the eternal Son of God. He didn't come into existence when he was born from this virgin womb, Mary's womb. He was pre-existent in heaven. He always existed as a member of the Trinity, the triunity of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Therefore, He has no beginning and He has no end. And so His birth did not begin when He was the babe of Bethlehem. He was pre-existent. Notice what Isaiah says in this prophecy. He tells us, first of all, in verse 6, notice, and we're only going to look at verse 6 this morning, he says, For unto us a child 
is born, unto us a son is given. A child is born. A son is given. We're told that this child would be a son, a man-child. It's amazing to me that God the Son, eternally existent in the heavens, would become a little child, a little baby, the most powerful person in the universe would become one of the weakest and frailest, dependent on a mother, someone who was independent of anything and of any other power would become dependent as a young baby. It blows me away. You know, God could have sent His Son as a fully grown man, just like many scholars believe Adam, the first Adam, the first man, was not uh, created as a baby, but he was created as a grown man. The question always is, did he have an ad- a, a belly button, right? I mean, we're going to put that stone, right? He, you know he had a, per- a piercing, right? No. Uh, did Adam have a belly button? He wasn't born of a woman, you know? It's interesting. Jesus could have simply shown up as a grown man, but no, he became a young child. Unto us a child is born, a son is given. The sonship here, speaking of the Son of God. He not only was a human, the eternal person, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Holy Trinity, took on humanity. He was fully human, and yet fully God. He didn't cease to be less God when He took on humanity. It's important to know that the humanity that Jesus took on didn't have a sin nature. And so He wasn't like you and I in that we have a sin nature. We have two natures. Uh, As believers in Jesus Christ, we have the nature of God within us now. We've been born again, born from above. But we also have a sin nature, don't we? The inclination, the desires to sin. Jesus didn't have that sin nature. Think of Jesus as taking on the nature of Adam in the beginning when Adam was perfect. He had perfect humanity. He didn't have a sinful nature. The beauty of it is that Jesus took on humanity. Why? So that He can pay the price of humanity. The price of our sin. That's why He took on humanity this morning. It's interesting, the third part of that passage, Nona says, and the government will be upon His shoulder. Ultimately, this part of the prophecy will be fulfilled when Jesus comes again a second time. The government will be upon His shoulder. He will govern the world. The Bible says when Jesus comes again for, two, for a thousand years, that's called the millennial reign of Christ. Jesus will reign on this earth, and we, believers, with Him. We're going to come back with the Lord, and He's going to set up His kingdom here on this earth. It's going to be a great time. You could reference Revelation chapter 20, verse 4 and 6, Isaiah chapter 11, Zechariah 14, when Jesus will come and fulfill this part of His promise, this prophecy here. Lastly this morning, I want to consider the names of Jesus. Notice the five names that are given to us this morning. The first one, of course, it says there His name will be called Wonderful. Wonderful. Why is His name called Wonderful? You know, if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, this term, Wonderful, is for you and I because sometimes we get bored in life, don't we? Well, if you're a Christian, in your pursuit of Jesus Christ, this is for your boredom, so you don't get bored. Man, if you're truly pursuing Jesus as your Savior, you shouldn't be bored, because He's wonderful. This is what makes Jesus awesome, amazing. It, it, it should produce an awe in our life as we're seeking the Lord. 
He's wonderful. The men, when we go through the book of Judges together, in Judges chapter 13, remember the story of Samson? That he-man with the she-weakness? When God told the parents of Samson that they were going to have a son, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared to the parents of Samson. Do you know who the angel of the Lord is? It was Jesus. And the parents asked this messenger from heaven, what is your name? That when you leave and depart, we may offer a sacrifice to you. And Jesus responded and he said, why do you ask me my name? Seeing that it is wonderful. It's wonderful. It was Jesus appearing to Samson, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. He's wonderful. Has God been wonderful to you this year as we come to a close in this year? Has God been wonderful to you? Isn't he wonderful? I love him. Psalm 46 verse 10 reminds us to be still and know that he is God. One translation uh, paraphrase says, you know what? Stop the traffic. Get out of the traffic and just acknowledge that your God is good. That your God is amazing. He is wonderful. Secondly, notice he's the counselor. He's the counselor. He's the only one fit to give us guidance for every decision that we have in life. That's why he's our counselor. And how does he counsel us? Well, many times he uses other people, doesn't he? We call up mom or we call up dad or that brother or that sister, that other pastor maybe. We call Ed Taylor on the radio, right? Grace FM. To get his perspective. How does God counsel us? Well, here, this is his counsel right here, the Word of God. And if you're a part of the Calvary family, then you could praise God because, you know what, we teach the Word of God here. And we go through the full counsel of a God from Genesis all the way to Revelation, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And listen, you need to make Christ and His Word your chief counselor. Man, he better be the first one you go to when you need counsel. You better not call Ed. You better not call me. You go to the Lord. You pray and ask God to give you counsel and wisdom. You look into his word. Don't go to the psychiatrist or the psychic hotlines or the horoscopes. You know, don't go to those things. Go to the Lord. Don't ask Siri or Google. Go to the Lord. He has a perfect plan for you. And you know, you need to be careful who your counselors are. Remember, it was the counsel of Satan that deceived Eve in the garden and brought sin into humanity. Be careful who your counsels are, counselors. Psalm 1, verse 1 through 3 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, or stands in the path of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, whose fruit is brought forth in its season, whose leaf doesn't wither, and whatever he or she does will prosper. The Word of God. Meditate on it. Thirdly, notice he's called, his name is called the Mighty God. And this is for us when we need strength and power for the demands of life. We can look to our Mighty God. Another way we could say it is the Almighty God. He's, he's spoken of in Revelation chapter 1 as the Almighty, speaking of Jesus. The Mighty God. You know, today we're you know, seeking power, aren't we? Maybe in your job, you're seeking a, a powerful position. Or maybe in the gym, you want to be the most powerful man or woman. Or under the hood of your car. You want that horsepower, right? So you could blow people off the line. Well, you know what? Jesus has all the power that we need. As we get exhausted in this world from all these things that we do, 
We could always get a recharge and refueled and empowered by God. Remember Jesus in Acts chapter 1 as we studied it? He, when he was ascending into heaven, what did he tell his disciples? Man, he said, I don't want you doing one thing for me without receiving the power from on high. We need the power of God to do the work of God. Because I, as I said last week, the Christian life isn't just hard, it's impossible without the power of God. This Christian life that we're living was not meant to be lived in the power of your own strength, but in the power that God's Holy Spirit provides. Jesus himself has come to live within us by his Spirit. He is Emmanuel. Isaiah 7, 14 says, God with us. And he gives us power to live. You see, those things that you received under the tree this week, man, they're going to break down. They're going to lose its power. we got to plug our phones back in. They break down. And then we have to call Apple or whoever you, you call when your phone breaks down, right? And what are they going to ask you? Did you plug it in? Did you charge it? And God would ask us the same. Are you plugged in to the power source? Have you recharged? Have you got together with the Lord? Have you received power from the Lord? Fourthly, this morning, his, his name is the Everlasting Father. And, and this speaks of our future. He's taking care of our future. He's the Father of Everlasting. Understand that His name, Everlasting Father, doesn't mean that He is the Father. You see, the Godhead is what? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. This term, the Hebrew word everlasting Father, the way we should understand it is that He is the author of eternality or of eternity. He is the Father or originator of everlasting life. In other words, He was there in the beginning. He was, he'll be there in the end. He's everlasting. When your batteries run out, God is always going to be there to give you strength, to give you counsel. When your friends run out on you, or your parents turn their back on you, or whoever it is, your boyfriend, your husband, your girlfriend, Jesus is everlasting. He'll always be there. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never abandon you or desert you. He's everlasting. He's going to be there for you. You can depend on Him. And then lastly, notice He's the Prince of Peace. And this takes care of those disturbances in life, doesn't it? Those things that we don't expect. When that appliance breaks down at your house or that unexpected snowstorm, or your vehicle breaks down, those unexpected problems. You're on your way to work, you, you, you run into a train, and you're stuck there. Those disturbances. Hey, don't fret, don't worry. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He's able to give you a peace that surpasses our human understanding. He's the Prince of Peace. In the midst of the storms of this life, you know, when we see violence taking place all around this globe, in Paris or San Bernardino or wherever the next place is going to be, and we get all freaked out about the violence, you know, we're, we're looking over our shoulder all the time. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. You can rest. You could be at peace in your heart. Why? Because you know where you're going. You have the assurance to know that, man, if you were to die this morning, that you'd go to heaven. He's the Prince of Peace. Isn't that beautiful? That whatever storm is coming or you're in maybe this morning, that God is able to calm the storm. You remember that great story where Jesus is in the boat with his disciples. He's asleep. And his disciples are freaking out. The storm, the water's coming into the boat and, and they're waking up Jesus. Don't you care that we're dying? We're going so to die out here in the ocean? Not with Jesus in the boat, right? 
Hey, is Jesus in your boat? Is he the captain? Is he steering your ship? Then you don't have to worry. He's the Prince of Peace. He'll calm the storm. Not only will he calm the storm, but he is the one who has made peace with the Father. Through his death, he made peace. He, he took away the stain of sin, the record of wrongs that was against us, that Adam, when he bombed out in the garden, man, Jesus took away the repercussions, the penalty of that sin, which is death. Jesus, through his own death and becoming that child, growing up to be a man, remember he suffered on that cross for you and for me so that we wouldn't have to suffer and die for all of eternity. What's in a name, church? If it's the name of Jesus, then it's everything, right? He's everything that we need. And the Bible says in Acts 2.21 that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You'll be saved. You'll be saved from the penalty of your own sin. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, when the devil accuses you of sinning, because we still sin, right? We still blow it. And they call the devil the accuser of the brethren. He goes up to the heavens and he accuses you and I before God. But if you're a believer this morning, you know, they could look at your file up in heaven and say, man, there's nothing there. It's blank. It's been erased. There's a big splat, maybe, of the blood of Jesus. It's washed away the record of wrongs that was against you. If you're a believer in Jesus this morning, the record of wrongs against you has been wiped away. But maybe you're here this morning and you haven't chosen Jesus. You haven't confessed your sin this morning before the Lord and said, Lord, I'm a sinner and I know that you died in my place for my sin. If you haven't done that this morning, then we want to invite you to confess Jesus as your Savior, to confess Him as your Lord. You can say, Jesus, take the will. Take control. I surrender. I believe that you came as that babe in Bethlehem that you grew up, that you lived a holy life, a sinless life, and you became my perfect substitution upon that cross, that you were buried, and on the third day you rose again. You ascended into heaven and you're coming back. He's coming back, church. And we need to be ready. If you're not ready this morning, and you're saying to me, Pastor, I need some more time. I'm still young. I want to party. I want to do my own thing. Listen, we don't have tomorrow promised. The Bible tells us that in the book of James. Today is a day of salvation. The Bible says today if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart. Don't close the door. Don't shut the door to Him. He's a gentleman. He's waiting for you to open the door of your heart to Him. And so if there's anybody here this morning... Maybe you don't know Jesus as your Savior. You've never asked Him to come in and to forgive you and to take away your sin. You've never surrendered your life to Him before. And if you need to do that this morning, we want to invite you to do that. I'm going to ask the musicians, the worship team to come back up this morning. And we're going to close. If you're here, maybe you're here and you, you came with a friend or a family member and you don't know the Lord you would like to ask Jesus to forgive you. You would ask Jesus to come into your life and to be your Savior, to be your Lord. You don't have an assurance of heaven this morning. You don't know if you would be accepted into that place. But you could know for sure. As the Bible says, as we read in Acts chapter 2, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Do you want to call upon Him this morning? 
Listen, I'd love to pray with you with the acknowledgement. If there's anybody here, just lift up your hand and say, Pastor, I want to call upon the Lord. I've never asked Jesus to forgive me. I want to pray with you that prayer, asking Jesus to come in and take over my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. Just slip up your hand so I could see it and you could put it down. Is there anybody here this morning you would like to pray with me? I would love to pray with you, inviting you into the family of God this morning. There's two destinations after this life. It's either heaven or hell. And Jesus spoke about both of them. The place called heaven is a, is a narrow pathway. Few there are that find it. But broad is the way, Jesus said, that leads to destruction. And there are many that will head in that direction. Do you need the Lord's help this morning? He is the only way, the truth, and the life, he said. No man comes to the Father except through him. Is there anybody this morning? Lift up your hand. You're acknowledging this morning. Will you pray with me, Pastor? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I was to die today or if Jesus was to come back today that he would take me, but I want to be sure. Is there anybody here this morning you'd like to make that decision? Just slip up your hand and we'll pray with you. Anybody? Anybody listening on the radio or watching this back on the internet? I want to pray this prayer, and if you need to choose Jesus Christ, if you're here this morning, you pray this prayer with me, and if you need to talk to somebody, there's going to be some prayer counselors hanging around, and we'd love to pray with you. But if you need to receive Jesus this morning, then you pray this prayer with me, something like this. Father, I believe that Jesus died on that cross for my sin. I believe as the Bible declares that he was buried and on the third day he was raised to life again. And he did that for me, for my sin. And I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me of my sin. I ask you to come into my life and to be my Savior and to be my Lord. From this day forward, I choose to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And give me the strength and the power each day to live for you from this day forward. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for dying for me. In Jesus' name we pray these words. Amen. If you said that prayer for the first time, or maybe you're saying it again, just to be sure. And if you would like to talk to somebody about what it means to be a Christian, we would love to put a Bible in your hands if you don't have one. And we would love to get some information real briefly so we could keep in contact with you and we could encourage you in your Christian walk. If you don't have a home church, we'd love for you to consider this your home church.